Good morning, Gospel Hope. Thank you, worship team. How are you doing, Jesse? I'm good. <laughs> and Ben. Anyone else? Yeah. And Elizabeth. Yes, how are you? Well, thank you, brother. Hey, listen, uh, if this is your first time at Gospel Hope, good morning to you and welcome. If that's you, if I just spoke to you, would you kind of throw your hand up real quick? If you are visiting with us as a special guest, good to see that hand, good to see that face. I see you there. I see you. If I missed any, I hope we didn't miss you at the Connect table. Uh, we have a special gift set aside for you, so we would love to just kind of show you some additional love. Uh, make sure you pick one of those up uh, on your way in or on, stop by the table on your way out if you have not already received that. So it is awesome to have you here, and uh, we hope that your hearts will be blessed. Um, if you may have uh, heard Pastor Ryan say we're opening up a new series uh, where we're going to be exploring for just a, a, just a couple of weeks, obviously, the particular particulars of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, him raised and us being raised with him. And what does that mean? Um, you know, if you've been through Gospel Hope 101, which is probably 95% of the room, if you are members of Gospel Hope Church, or maybe if you just heard a few of our sermons online or even in person, you'll often hear us say something like, uh, you know, the gospel is not just the diving board or the front door into the Christian faith. It is the whole swimming pool or it's the whole house. And the reason that we say that is because we can fall into a trap of where we think we're talking about the gospel and the particulars of the death, burial, and resurrection around Easter time. And then once we get done with that, those principles go in the rearview mirror. But the reality is that story never gets old and those principles are never in the rearview mirror. They are always making up the total fabric of the Christian life. And so I hope you'll join me today in just kind of a deeper look at uh, the great work of Jesus Christ on the cross and that this wouldn't just be an Easter a reflection for you or a Palm Sunday reflection, it would be something that really shapes your understanding of uh, the work of God on an ongoing basis. Um, I'm going to pray for us in just a moment because we need God. And one of the interesting things that happens in my heart during worship, I don't know if you're doing this or not, and this is not a prescription of what you should do, it's more of a description of what I do. Um, you know, as I'm standing there and I'm singing the various songs, not only am I enjoying them melodically, but I'm also testing the message of the psalms or the songs to see if I really believe that. And the proof that I really believe that is whether or not I am behaving in accordance with what I'm saying. Because I want to worship the Lord as Jesus said I should in spirit and in truth. I not only want it to be true vocabulary, but I want it to be true of my personal vocation, the adventure of life and how I live. And so I'm listening to one of our earlier songs. I'm going to talk about a couple of the songs uh, throughout the, the, the message. But uh, the earlier song said, Lord, all of my hope is in you. And that sounds so good. And I begin to ask myself, Rod, is all of your hope in the Lord? Or is he just kind of the biggest bucket? You know, but you have multiple kind of little boxes of hope stored all around town. Uh, and Jesus is just the largest of which. Is all of my hope really in him? And so I don't know about you, but I know that I probably got Jesus is my biggest repository of hope, but I just don't know if he's all, has all my hope. And I want to fight for that. And I hope you'll join me as we, as we do that in prayer. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you this morning reflecting on the fact that all my hope should be in you if it's not already there. I want my hope, oh God, not just for deep, long-standing spiritual things. I don't just want you to become my exclusive hope provider when it comes to the ideas of getting into heaven. But Lord God, I want you to be my exclusive hope provider and repository here on earth in all things. Lord God, would you be my only and my all hope for my children for my family, for my wife, for my home, for uh, my business, for uh, ministry, for my health, for my, uh, Lord God, for my future, in every way, shape, or form, would you be, Lord God, my only hope? And these are big words, and it's a tall order, and Lord God, I know that it is a much deeper request than just saying it. It's easier said than done, but Lord God, would you, in your own wonderful way, continue to train all of our hearts to put all of our hope in you? This morning, oh God, um, our hope is in you in several ways, and I'd like to ask for your help to get there if we're not already there. Lord God, um, I ask that you would just move me completely out of the way. Allow your words, your Savior, your principles to be fully and clearly seen. 
allow your son to be beautified and allow your people to be perfected and made more ready for serving in ministry. And also, Lord God, open their eyes that they would see you clearly. Lord God, I pray that whatever impetus resulted in people coming today, whatever impediments they may have brought with them, things that their task that they just completed or things that they have to get done uh, immediately after service that may be occupying space in their hearts and minds, feelings that they may have harbored, uh, Lord God, emotions that may be robbing them of their complete and total hope and focus on you in this moment. Lord God, would you clear the ledger? Would you just press pause in our lives on all those things that are competing with us being all in on you? We need your help in this way. Lord God, would you find us at our respective addresses? Would you take this word spoken by a fallen, broken man and package it in a little envelope in a way that shows up in the hearts of people in this audience that makes it so absolutely stunningly clear that you are speaking to them that they are compelled to repent and to worship? Would you do that, O oh God? And this is our earnest request in the matchless and holy name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you got your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn with me in them to the book of Romans. The book of Romans, and in particular, work your way over to chapter 4. Chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, we're going to focus our attention to begin with on verses 21 through 25. In focusing on verses 21 through 25, we are looking at the tail end of an argument where the Apostle Paul is punctuating an earlier argument started in the beginning of chapter 4 regarding the great work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, but utilizing the example of the lives of Abraham and Sarah from the Old Testament as his illustration. I'll read it for us. Beginning with verse 21, it says, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Again, this is the exclamation point on a much larger argument that Paul is making that begins in the earlier parts of Romans chapter 4. But before we get started, I'd like to ask you or just borrow your imagination for a moment. Um, imagine for a moment uh, you are away at work or maybe out just running some errands. And while you're away, one of the greatest landscape architects of all time is driving through your subdivision or your neighborhood and sees your home, your house, and decides to pull up and say, oh my goodness, look at these shrubs, look at these hedges, I have an idea. He gets out of his vehicle and he starts up his, uh, his landscaping uh, hedge trimmers, or maybe he uses the manual ones. But, but whatever he's doing, he goes there and he begins to work so dutifully and artfully for hours. And then finally, you come home from work or from your errands or whatever. And as you pull up in the driveway, you are met by this man. He's a French guy, right? He's wearing a beret and the whole nine. He's got the cigarette on the long thing hanging out. Hello, madame. Right? If that's a good French accent. And he introduces himself by name, and you have to Google it, but you find out he's one of the greatest landscape architects of all time, and he has masterfully clipped and cut and carved several of your hedges into Disney characters, the foremost of which is none other than Mickey Mouse. And it's so well done, you can see the particulars of his teeth. You can see the, the little round nose. You can see the divots in his ears. You can see those very prominent eyes. You can even see levels of detail like where his little white gloves end and where his sleeves begin. This guy is a master landscape architect and artist. And as you, as, as, as you marvel at this work, it is indeed impressive. You've never seen anything like this. You have to, uh, it's astounding what he's been able to do with mere shrubs and a set of shears. As the conversation continues, then he closes by presenting you with an invoice. Madame, the invoice. 
Now, at this point, you're just a little bit taken aback and somewhat perturbed. But he is very forceful about the fact that you should compensate him. You should reward him for his great work. He's one of the greatest landscape artists and architects in the world. As a matter of fact, he has been contracted by the Walt Disney family to even do work not only at the various campuses that they have for Disneyland and Disney World, but he also does the personal properties of the families themselves. And as he continues to tell you about his resume and the excellence of his work, which you do not deny, you can see how gifted and skilled he is. You can see the excellence of what he's done. He continues to press in and say, the invoice. And you're like, no, I'm not paying that. Obviously, your accent, wherever you're from, is increasing in intensity because you're, you're annoyed. And his accent is increasing in intensity because he's annoyed and he can't figure out why you won't pay based on how excellent his efforts are. And you finally kind of draw a line in the sand. And you say, sir, I'm not paying this because regardless of how good your work is, it's not approved. This isn't what I ask for. I didn't ask you to do this. Furthermore... I didn't invite you on my property, which means you're trespassing. If you can feel that, AJ, if you can feel that, then you can also feel the strength of Paul's argument in Romans chapter 4 as he helps us to appreciate the value and the virtue and the, 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 the strength of God's work in Jesus Christ, where he's going to make this argument that our work, regardless of how beautiful and grand, is not enough to satisfy the heart of God. It does not earn salvation, but it is Jesus' work on the cross, which is the great work. But why does he use the lives of Abraham and Sarah, or as I will continue to refer to them, Abram and Sarah, to illustrate this? Here's why. If you're a Bible reader, and particularly if you're a, papal bi a paper Bible reader, I guess you can do this on an electronic screen. This is my little old man rant here. Uh, if you're sitting at your kitchen table and you're reading a paper Bible, and you go over to Genesis chapter 12 because you want to find the story of Abram and Sarai. As you're reading Genesis chapter 12, right over here to the left on that other page in your periphery, can't do this on an iPad or on a phone. But if you're just, if you're a little paper Bible right here, you can't help but see right there in Genesis chapter 11 is the story of the Tower of Babel. Now, I believe that what you're witnessing when you look at Genesis chapter 11 and 12 is an intentional genius of the Holy Spirit to invite us into the simultaneous strength and beauty of God's word through what I call literary juxtaposition. I don't call it literary juxtaposition. That's what it is. Well, you take two things and put them real close together for the purpose of comparison. Why? You see, the Tower of Babel is a story of mankind putting together its best of all possible efforts to reach God. They get together with perfect unity, communication, collaboration, arm in arm, speaking the same language. Everybody's on the same page. There is no discrepancy on what they need to do when they exited the Zoom call. Everybody knows their gift, their skill. They know exactly what they should be doing. This is one of the greatest corporate initiatives of all time because it incorporates every available hand on the planet. And it is impressive work. As a matter of fact, it is so impressive that God himself says, that's impressive. And if I don't come down, and if no one stops them, if I don't stop them, nobody can. And they set out to build this monument or this tower that would reach up to heaven. And that's what you have in Genesis chapter 11. Smack dab in the middle of the genealogy of Shem. It's so oddly placed. But why? Well, as you're coming from the genealogy of Shem, because that's one of the three brothers who's now uh, assigned with the reproduction on the earth after God has kind of pressed control, alternate delete on all things, right? We've got the flood. So here it is. Here it is, the genealogy of Shem. Then we go right smack dab into a discussion of the Tower of Babel. And then God stops the work of the Tower of Babel. And then we pick up with the genealogy of Shem. And we are, uh, our attention is brought to a man named Terah. And then Terah is then, his genealogy ends with Abram and Sarah. Or Sarah. Why is this important? It's important 
Because while we see the story of Abram and Sarah as the godfathers and the godmothers of faith, trusting God to do great work through them that they could not do otherwise, it is literally juxtaposed to the greatest work of mankind to do work to reach God on our own strength and power. I believe that's why the two stories live next door to each other. So that we can see this dynamic contrast that there is no way that man, like the great landscape architect that we all are, and our wonderful effort and our beautiful resume, no matter how great the work of the Tower of Babel was, God stopped it because it was not approved. Not only was it unapproved, it was a work of trespass. This is a great trophy of your sins and trespasses. I don't care how beautiful and collaborative and unified it was. It is not approved. Mankind, I am not rewarding you. I am not paying your invoice. You do not get tickets to heaven because you built this great work. I believe that the Tower of Babel is mankind's greatest work. And the book of Romans is known as the magnum opus which is Paul's greatest work. Can I get y'all to say magnum opus? Magnum opus. You're going to need that later in the sermon. A magnum opus is one's greatest work. Michelangelo's magnum opus is what? Sistine Chapel. Very good. Very good. Anytime a, a, a great writer, a worker, or artist puts together something that is their greatest and their grandest and their deepest in volume and greatest in depth, their most comprehensive in display, it is noted as their magnum opus. And so the book of Romans is, is Paul's magnum opus. He gives us the greatest and the broadest and the deepest theology we've ever seen. I argue to many of you, as I did with the people in the first service, that, that, that if, your, if, if the book of Romans is not the home of your favorite Bible passage, it is at least home of the heart of your favorite Bible passage. Because there is no jot, no tittle, no small speck of theology that doesn't get covered in the book of Romans. Something that you love about God is found in the book of Romans, even if you don't like the Apostle Paul. Some of you love passages like all things will work together for good to them that love the Lord and are calling according to his purpose. You like that. That's, that's home in the book of Romans. Some of you like it when the, when, the, when the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. You like that. That that's comes from the book of Romans, just in case you didn't know it. But I can assure you that even if your favorite passages are found in other places in the Bible, that the heart of that passage, the heart of its truth is found somewhere in the book of Romans. It is Paul's magnum opus, which means what? Greatest work. When we look at mankind's greatest work, the Tower of Babel, it fails miserably to meet God's approval. And it's situated in Scripture right next door to the story of Abraham and Sarah. Why? Well, immediately after finding Abraham and Sarah, not in chapter 12, that's why they get famous. But the first mention of Abraham and Sarah is at the end of Genesis chapter 11, shares the same chapter with the Tower of Babel. Here's why it's important. The Bible first mentions Abraham and Sarah as this, essentially this older, broken man and his barren wife. It was the Bible, not me. I'm not shaming her. I am just simply showing what the Bible says. Her first mention is that she is a woman who cannot bear children. And the Bible seems to think that that is significant in understanding who they are and how God would work through them and use them. Well, here it is. Immediately following our first introduction to Abram and Sarai, this 75-year-old man who comes from uh, uh, pretty much the theological lineage of people who were failed and confused in their work at the Tower of Babel. They also come through the biological lineage of a man who is an impotent idol worshiper. In other words, Abram and Sarah did not bring to the table some kind of kindling for great faith that God just kind of lit a match to. They brought nothing. Their whole lives were counterintuitive uh, to what God wanted to do through them. And I think when the Bible shows up, oh, when, when the Holy Spirit shows up and gives us chapter 12, and then it says that God reaches out to Abram and says these words in, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, he says, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And to him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, you shall be a blessing. When he says that to them, we see it is God reaching them and them not reaching him. Follow me very carefully. 
God finds Abraham and Sarah. They didn't find him. God finds us. We do not find him. You see, the theological lineage of every one of us is the Tower of Babel. We are working hard to find God on our own terms and merit, and we cannot. But it is at the chapter 12 where our story also begins where we see that God finds them. God finds us. It is his work. And these are one of the pillars of God's great work through Christ. Hence the kind of the capstone of today's message, and that is we need to fully trust God's work for us. And one of the initial stems of that work is this, he finds us, not us finding him. God is building a bridge to us. We are not building a bridge to him. Regardless of how dutiful and artful and gifted we are, God is building the bridge to us through Christ. We are not building a bridge to him. We tried to build a bridge to him and it was unapproved and it was incapable of satisfying the will of God. Why? Because if we had successfully built a God, the bridge to God, then we could boast. We could all look back and say, look, Lord, at what we built. You owe us entrance. But God would not allow salvation to be engineered in that way. He would only allow it to be worked out through the work of Christ. Take a, a, a quick glimpse with me at verses 21 and 22. Verses 21 and 22 says in Romans chapter 4, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, that is why faith was counted to him as righteousness. Not only does God find us because we cannot successfully find him, but a second work is this, God makes promises that are above our pay grade. What do you mean above our pay grade? Well, I read to you the, 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 the pillar of the Abrahamic promise. He says that I will make you a great nation. I'll give you a great name and I will bless all nations through you. How is that going to happen through a man whose name is counterintuitive to the assignment? Abram's name is Abram, a father, but he has no kids. How is he going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth? How is he going to have children and offspring that are as multitudinous as the sands of the seashore or the stars of the sky? How will that happen? It's a promise that is above his pay grade. Sarah is introduced to us at the end of Genesis chapter 11 as a woman who is barren. Not the fact that she just hadn't gotten around to having kids because her career took off. It says she can't. So how is the Lord going to bless the whole world through them? How are they going to become a great nation? Their names and their frame are broken and fallen. How can they possibly live up to this promise? And that's the point. God makes promises that are so far above our pay grade that we have to trust his work and power through us to make it come to pass. But it's not just Abram and Sarah that God does that through. He's doing it also to me and you. Try these words on for size. Little children, you are from God and have overcome him. This is 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Talking about the Holy Spirit because God knows that the assignment that we have is above our pay grade. Oh, it gets even richer. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. How is this possible? It's above our pay grade. John chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, Jesus talking with Mary, uh, uh, follow, or Martha, uh, on the hills of raising uh, uh, Lazarus from the dead. And he says, I know, she says, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. How is that possible? That's above my pay grade. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? How can I? That's above my pay grade. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's a staggering assignment. That's not just a t-shirt. That's a call that God says will be a part of our personal mission. That's above my pay grade. And intentionally so, because when it is above my pay grade, these, these, these promises require that I trust God's promises or trust his power working in me more than I would trust anything that is already at work within me. I bring no prowess to the table. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 19. This is why Abram and his faith is so celebrated and God's work through him accordingly. 
He did not weaken in faith when he considered that his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. In other words, he did not waver in faith, even though he knew that what God said he would do was above his pay grade. And what did God do? Through his own power, he changed their identities to match their activity and their assignment. He challenged their trust. It wasn't just a cosmetic shift on their birth certificate so you'll now be called Abraham and Sarah. What else did he have to do? They went out and tried to perform the promises of God by having a huddle, a strategy huddle. They had a team meeting and said, bring in Hagar. I know how to have a child so we can perfect the promises of God. Abram, why don't you get down with her and boom, there's your child. Let's get on with the business of populating the planet and blessing all families. Dear God, come on down here. We got a solution for you. You didn't think about this. And God says, that's not approved. You still, done, you still got the Tower of Babel in your system. You still think I need your help. And so Ishmael, blessed as he may be, he's not, uh, he's not the Isaac. He's not the child of promise. He's the child of their own personal prowess. He's unapproved. The promise of God was above their pay grade. Exponentially, it, 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 you've, you've heard this in the Bible before, exceedingly abundantly above all that we are able to ask or think. I mean, I think about that when I'm praying about the proverbial birthday cake. Yeah, God, please do some exceedingly above, above everything I can ask or think. No, that is the very DNA of my salvation. And so, take a look here with me at verses 23 through 25. Let's get into some brass tacks. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and then raised for our justification. It is God who has engineered and wired salvation in such a way that he has to qualify us for salvation. That's what justification means. It is God qualifies us to be worthy recipients of this great work. God qualifies us for salvation in a way that most glorifies the Son. I was... I was sitting in the first service, and you heard it here too. There is this little piece at the end of, uh, of, of one of the songs that says, I will never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Uh, the words of that song are designed, in, in, invited to, to not defeat us or depress us or make you say, you know, get out of here, this is above your pay grade. Grown people talking, you'll never know how much it costs to see your sins on that cross. No, no, no. It is an invite to continuously explore that beautiful reality. I'll never forget um, at the age of 17 when I found out that my mother paid for my tuition in the pre-Zell Miller, pre-Hope era. She paid for my tuition to a private school here in Atlanta out of her 401k. At the age of 17, I had no 401k, and so I did not know what it meant to make a drawdown before the age of 62 and a half. I never knew. Now, I knew, I knew what the invoice was, and so I would learn that. I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of expensive. But I still didn't know what a 401k was. I would never know. We're not ready for that, Chad, but thank you. I never knew. I grew up. Not only recognizing what the cost of college was, because then I started paying for it myself after that moment, but then I also, I also figured out what a 401k was, because I got one of my own. And then once I got one of my own, I started learning the rules of like, you know, what happens when you put money in there, how hard it is to get it to really accumulate. And I was like, you pull money out of this? I never knew. Then I figured out the rules like, you know, how you get taxed and how you get hit over the head. And at the time that my mom would have done this, she would have been like in her 40s. I was like, I never knew. I believe that the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf on the cross is the same way. 
You never know. And we just incrementally throughout our lives are making these discoveries of how much it costs to see our sins upon that cross. And, and, and so the work of Jesus just has this beautiful bouquet of how God qualifies us for salvation. What it means to see our trespasses placed upon him. You see, justification says that through Jesus that the Father has canceled our debt, our proverbial student loans, the whole deal canceled at the cross so there's no longer a, a, a debt against us. Another prong of justification is this. Our trespasses are placed upon him, and then he counts us as righteous. So he changes our status and our identity and our names, just like he did Abraham and Sarah. But then the Bible says he also considers us as children of God. This is the great work of justification that God cancels the debt against us. He counts us as being righteous, and then he sees us just like he sees the Lord Jesus Christ. God qualifies us for salvation in a way that glorifies the Son most. And the reason that he does it in a way that glorifies the Son the most is so that we have no boast and that he becomes our only boast in salvation. So follow me carefully. The book of Romans is Paul's magnum opus his greatest work. The Tower of Babel is mankind's magnum opus. It's our greatest work. But it is Jesus Christ on the cross that is God's magnum opus. It is his greatest work. You think about the great work of artists, and you, if you've ever been to the Sistine Chapel, if you've ever seen the, the statue of David, you look at this and say, this, this, this started out as nothing. How could one ever do this? And then you look at yourself in the mirror of God's word, you should see the same thing. I was nothing. Why would God expend this for me? How could God do this? How can he make righteous a sinner? How can he make, how can he make a, a foreigner, a person totally disconnected from God and running in an opposite direction, how could he not only make us converts, but he makes us sons and daughters? The work of Jesus Christ is God's magnum opus. It is his greatest work. The resurrection does something in our lives that is extremely and exponentially above our pay grade that we can never do for ourselves. It qualifies us for salvation and then it saves us for those who would trust in it. My earnest prayer this morning for any of you that are hearing this message is you would recognize this and you would ask this, Lord, would you continuously open my eyes to the beauty of the work. Just like it may never get old for you to go and visit the Sistine Chapel and go, oh my goodness, I didn't see that brush stroke the last time. Hopefully it'll never get old for you to maybe go if you walk through a museum and you're like, oh my goodness, I've never seen the Mona Lisa like that. If you ever get a chance to see the statue of David, you'd be like, oh my gosh, look at the level of detail. I hope that you would also gaze in the scriptures and see the work of Jesus and say, oh my goodness, I've never seen those fine details and those brush strokes like that before. Look at that beautiful work that was done on my behalf. I hope you would see that. That's my prayer for you this morning. But my prayer is also this, that if you're a person out there who is still building your proverbial Tower of Babel, you are working hard. You are doing your best. I mean, you're doing your best. I mean, you're, you're, you're giving to the poor. You're, you're serving in orphanages. You are adopting pets. You are picking up trash. You are tutoring children who don't understand their work. You are serving cross-culturally. You're, you're building as many things as you know to do. You're doing all the great moral work, but there's one thing that you've left off. Are you doing that for yourself to build a bridge and tower to God, or are you doing it because of God's work that he wants to build in you? If you're here today and you believe that you can build a tower to God, that it'd be impressive enough that you'll get to heaven's door. And he'll say, man, that was a great accumulation. I'm going to be honest with you. That's going to be unapproved. He wants you to fully trust in the great work that he's done through Christ so that as you do do those great things, you do it from the power that is in the cross, not for the approval of God. 
We cannot build a tower to heaven on our own and our own merits, regardless of how dutiful, artful, or impressive. And the reason is he wants Jesus Christ to be our only boast and his great work, that we will boast in his magnum opus. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm thankful to you this morning that you would invite us to see your scriptures and to see these broad strokes of redemption that reach all the way from the book of Genesis, all the way through to the book of Romans and all the way into our laps right here at 47 Covington Road. Lord God, as we find new beauty in how artfully you have worked out our salvation and then just invited us to enjoy and know it, Lord God, would our hearts be further enthralled to worship you. Lord God, if we do not know you, may the great lengths to which you have gone to qualify your people for salvation, the great lengths, Lord God, would our hearts be pierced by that and we'd be compelled to come forward and say, I want to know more about this Jesus. Lord God, for the person who is here and maybe they're visiting and it says, man, I'm looking for a church that teaches the Bible in a way that, that helps me see God more clearly. Lord God, for that person, I pray, if that's the move they need to make, that you would, you would call them forward. This is our earnest prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen to me. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross is, again, engineered so that we would have no boast in anything other than him. The Bible tells us quite clearly that that work is laid out in the following way. Jesus Christ gave his life voluntarily and substitutionarily. His life was not taken. He voluntarily loved us. Substitutionarily gave it because he died in your place for your trespasses. And that death was necessary because it was the only thing that could pay the great ticket price and the indebtedness that we had racked up, and it satisfied the wrath of God. So it was a necessary death. It's the only thing that can satisfy, not anything that you could bring. And then the Bible tells us that he was raised victoriously over sin, death, and the devil. He beat death. He beat the devil. He beat sin. And so not only has you, have there been a stay of execution, not only have they said no longer leave that one uh, for lethal injection, but there's also been an opening of the doors of your cell. You are no longer in bondage to whatever it is if you place your faith in Christ. If you want to know more about this gospel, would you come see us? Would you come see me? I'd love to have a conversation about all of that. In the meantime, let's worship him.